right. Hello and welcome to yet another session here at Generation 2020 online version. Uh, my name is Leon and I will be hosting this session for you. Um, well, thank you, first of all, for following us today throughout the whole day. And again, uh, to our sponsors who are still uh, sponsoring this online edition. And especially a big, big, big thanks to the person who we are here to see and hear, uh, which is Alex Soto. Hi, Alex. Uh, you're joining us from Barcelona. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Hello, and thank you very much for you know making this great event. How are you doing today? Good. I mean that you know it's adapting to the new life, right? Yeah. <laughs> Doing yeah. sessions online, yeah, something Going new. Going to conferences but... online, right? Yeah. <laughs> Working online. Yeah, but I'm used to to used to you know to do this kind of sessions nowadays. Yeah. yeah. So um, Alex is going to talk about chaos engineering and Kubernetes. But just before we start, and yet another reminder, you can always ask any questions that you want, either in the room Slack or on YouTube where you're following us. And yeah, feel free also to react on any of those questions or comments. Uh, Alex, the floor is yours, or virtual, this virtual floor, I guess. Uh, good luck. Thank you very much. Uh, OK, so um, probably if you're a developer, you don't want to wake up at 3 AM because of a failure in your application, right? So if you don't want to happen this to you, then this talk is for you. Thank you very much for joining this session about chaos engineering in Kubernetes. It's a pleasure to be uh, here with all of you. And please, as a, as a reminder again, if you have any question, please do it because I will be very happy to answer it. My name is Alex Soto. I'm, I work in Red Hat. I'm author of several books and cheat sheets and so on. And uh, when I do this kind of talks, I do talks about testing in production or chaos engineering, uh, some people tell me, uh, tell me after the sessions that, oh, look, this thing that you're, you're saying it's right, but it's totally stupid or it's totally useless or it's impossible that my manager will allow me to do that thing, right? And probably you are right, but when you are starting doing true microservices architecture. And when I say true microservices architecture, I mean like 100 microservices, 150 microservices, not just three or four, then this talk is really uh, useful. So a monolith, everyone know, uh, knows exactly how it looks like, right? It's a monolith, it contains some kind of modules inside the, the monolith because at the end you, you, know, you, you have a design on your monolith and you have some kind of modules and each of these modules has some components inside, right? But maybe it was like three, four, five years ago that we decided that it could be a good idea to break down all this monolith and create some kind of microservices. So we just pick it up all these uh, modules, all these components and make it a service on their own, right? So we start spinning them out and connecting all of them using the network. So you can say that we are really using into a service mesh. We've got this is a, a you know we've got a, a graph. It's not a tree a structure. It's a graph structure with several uh, communication between services. And these things makes our architecture more interesting. And of course, you know everyone here said, yeah, microservices. You need to move to microservices. It's the really best thing you have ever seen. So you know all industry just pushes up us to move. To microservices architecture, but microservices architecture has also some drawbacks. And let me explain to you one. This is my microservices architecture. And now, what's happened if there is a downtime in the middle of the mesh? There is one service that is failing. Well, basically, what is happening is that all the services that are depending on these services specifically and all the transitive services are failing as well. And this is what it's called temporal coupling, right? Because when we read about microservices, all of us say, yeah, microservices is about isolation. And notice that it's true that each of these microservices are isolated until one fails. When one microservice fails, then there is a cascade of failures. And now think about from the point of view of testing, um, how you can, per, uh, um, if you only have one service, it's predictable what's going to happen when this service fails. But now that we've got a combination of services, a combination of failures, it's almost impossible to know exactly how our system is going to behave. We can think like, okay, one service is failing, right? But 
I can try to figure out what's happening when this specific service is failing, but then what's happening with all other services? Can I predict how they are going to behave? Probably not. And this is why it's really important, this new concept, which is called testing in production. And basically, if you want to start doing testing in production, we need, it requires a change on the mindset, an appetite of risk, right? Because, you know, yeah, you are testing in your production cluster. So you need to, you know, see what's happening if something goes wrong, right? And also you need to start thinking that the way you are coding needs to be changed to this fact. So now when we change, we need, when we code, we need to change our way of thinking and start coding, having the failure in mind instead of the success, right? Some people uh, think that testing in production is something that you, you, know, you do on the wild, and it's not like that, right? And we are going to see right now why. But one of the nice concepts that has come with testing in production is that deploy is different than release, right? In the past, in the monolith architecture, doing a deploy or doing a release was more or less the same, right? Where you could say, I'm going to deploy to production or I'm going to release to production. It was pretty much the same uh, concept, the same process. But now with microservices and testing in production, deploy is one thing and release is another thing. Deploy is taking your service and put it on production. So you are effectively deploying the service inside production. But then there is the process of release. And the process of release is a start sending public traffic to this new service. So you can deploy to production, test this new service in production, but you are not sending public traffic to this pod. So if there is any failure, then it's not a really big issue. But then when you are pretty sure that the service is behaving as expected, then you start the release process, which is starting sending public traffic to it. So this is it's really important to have into consideration. Then most of you already knows probably that, that testing pyramid, right? That we, when we've got unit test, component test, and end-to-end -end test. But now with microservices and testing in production, this has changed a bit. And maybe I, I like to call this, if this is the new pyramid, right? Notice that I've got like four columns and the four columns, the blue one, it's a pre-production testing. Right? It's test the run before we go to production. For example, unit test, component test, coverage test, benchmark test, contract test, acceptance test, penetration test, smoke test, all these kind of tests happens before we go to production. Usually these tests are tests that are run uh, in your continuous integration, continuous uh, delivery deployment. Probably the uh, developers are able to run all of them from his own computer or in some way. But then we've got the second group of columns, which is the testing in production. That is this orange line, which says that all these columns are for testing in production. And in testing in production, that is that I split into three columns. One, which is green. And the green part is those tests that you're running when you deploy something in your production cluster, but you are not sending public traffic, right? In this um, category, we can say that there are integration tests, tab compare, load tests, shadowing, or config tests, right? Some people uh, ask me, but why you are putting integration tests in the deploy phase? And the reason is that running integration tests, and you can think like integration tests, like service to database communication, are done in pre-production with an empty database, with an in-memory database, so it has not much sense, right? Because there is no network. There is uh, no failures on, on, for example, the network. Uh, the uh, weight of data probably is different, right? The one that you have in production than the one you have on your pre-production or your staging environment. So when it has really sense to run integration tests is with the deploy um, base at uh, against the real uh, database or against the real services. Then when you are really sure about deploy, that deploy has been done co correctly and 
what is deployed, it's correct, it's behaving as expected. Then we move to the release column. This is another test. For example, canary releasing, dark canaries, monitoring, future flagging, exception tracking, future graduation, all these testing um, methodologies are in the release column. This is probably most of you knows exactly what is a canary release, right? Or a blue green um, deploy, um, um, release, right? These are tests that are run during the release phase. But now with testing in production and microservices, there is another column, which is the pause release. This is other tests that we are running all the time. Notice that if you think about Monolith, right? In how we work in the past, you can think that the test finish when our product goes to production. So when we deploy the service to production, then we said, okay, now testing is over and I'm going to start testing the, you know, the next version of the service. But now with microservices and testing in production, testing is also happening after the release. And this is what it's called the post release uh, phase where some techniques you can think is like taking profiling logs Chaos testing or chaos engineering. Okay, now we now we face the what we are going to talk about today. It's a post release technique. Monitoring, A/B testing, tracing, auditing, on call experience or journey test. All these tests happens when we are already having public traffic reaching our service. Of course, I know that you've seen a lot, a lot of probably new words, new test methodologies. I know, and you don't need to start at once doing all of them. Just pick up some and start applying these techniques with the easiest services, for example, stateless services or, or for example, services that has a lot of reads but not a lot of writes, things like that, and start step by step moving towards testing in production. But of course, let's talk about cows engineering and cost testing because at the end, this is what we want to talk about or why you have come here. So what is chaos engineering? Okay, chaos engineering is, inject, is injecting failures in your system on purpose to see how it behaves under these circumstances. Because at the end, you don't choose the moment when the failure happens. The moment chooses you, right? You only choose how prepared you are when it does. When there are failures, there are failures and you need to be prepared for them. So you can say, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to do anything. And just when it happens, then I will react. And maybe it's 3 a.m., that's fine. You're fine with this approach, then it's fine. But maybe you could try to um, anticipate what's going to happen. And if the response of your system under an error is the one that you wanted or you want you expect it or not. So everything will eventually fail over time. I mean, that maybe, it's a software network, maybe uh, maybe it's a software bug, maybe it's a problem in the network, or maybe it's a problem on S3, right? Because you remember maybe two or three years ago that probably most of the people said, yeah, Amazon S3 will never go down. Never, never, this is not going to happen. And then it happened and half of the, uh, of the uh, sites were down, right? So this, you know, probably most of you remember this, these days with Hoka, kind of the access to most of the sites because of yes, uh, 3 down. So the ultimate goal of cows testing, cows engineering is to maintain the application going running even in case of failures. Um, you can ignore this and say, that ah, doesn't matter. I'm going you know, to just uh, uh, continue doing in the ways I'm, I'm working nowadays, or you can start thinking about it and provide some fallbacks in case of errors. So the thing is that you need to move your uh, mindset and instead of assuming that there are no breakdowns, you need to move to a model where breakdowns were considered to be inevitable, right? So you need to build resiliency in your uh, system. You need to think all the time, what's happened if this, this um, service is down? What's happened if the database is down? What's happened if this external service is down? What's happened if the cache is behaving correctly? What's happened if, you know, you need to ask yourself this kind of things. We're going to see it later how to do it, right? And then 
see how your system behaves. Because the good way of doing in this in this way, in testing it, is that you choose the moment. You choose when you want to do it. Maybe you want to do it at uh, 1 p.m. when all the engineers are on the on the on, on site working on the problem. Or maybe you want to do it at 2 a.m. because it's when there is less traffic. That's fine, right? But at least you choose the moment. The moment doesn't choose you. And of course, that I know that might sound scary, right? Than saying, okay, you're telling me that I need to bring my application, right? On production. How do you want I sell this to my manager? Because, you know, no manager will never allows me to do these kind of things. And that's true. But the problem is that you have not explained it correctly what it's about cloud engineering, cloud testing. Because what is important with cloud engineering is that you want to build your app application more resilient. So cloud engineering is about resilience. It's not, it's not about breaking things, right? Because um, if, you, if you sell to your um, manager that I want to make my application more resilient, obviously he will not say, oh, no, no, no. I don't want to be um, our application more resilient. No, it's not going to happen. Everyone wants his application be more error prone, more uh, resilient, right? More uh, able to work even in difficult circumstances, right? So um, think about this. Chaos engineering is about resiliency. It's, an, it's not about chaos. But even if you Test an example, uh, test a cow, write a test, a cow's test, and then you run it, and then it causes some problem. See that in reality, it's not causing any problem. What it's really doing is revealing the problem, right? It's, it's telling you, look, if you try this and someday this happens, then this is the problem that you're going to find it. So it's, it's up to you. To fix it or not. So, what are the phases of cow? So, because I, I'm talking about exactly what is uh, cow engineering, right? Injecting problems on your production cluster and see what's happening. Uh, this helps us to uh, develop better um, programs because you know if we if we run experiments, then we can see where um, our services are not really. Uh, when it's not really good, when they are having some problems, and then we can act and fix those problems before it happens in the real uh, time. But to do that, we need to make some order, right? And this order is like these phases. We've got a steady state, we've got the hypothesis uh, phase, the run phase, the validate phase, and the fixed phase. Okay, then a steady state. What is a steady state? Well, at the end, a steady state is just defining some outputs that defines that your system is behaving as expected, right? I mean, that sometimes these um, outputs can be that there are no 500 errors, no 400 errors. There are all my services are returning to uh, HTTP codes, but sometimes there are other, for example, um, performance. Right, you are checking that all the services are uh, performing well. There, are, there are no um, um, services that, because of some problems, they are start outperforming. Right, they are start uh, working really, really slow. Okay, but also there could be a business metrics, metrics that are specific to the business. And in this case, let me show you this graph. This is for from um, Netflix. This is the number of plays. That you that users do on the Netflix app. Notice that there is some kind of um, um, oscillation, right? Probably here is like I don't know after dinner. Then after dinner you go to sleep. Everyone is going to sleep. Then you you here you wake up. You start working, and then after the work you start watching a bit of Netflix, right? And then it's after the dinner you everyone see watch any series, and again it's repeating. Right? This is a real traffic. Then what's happening if I, uh, um, when Netflix does um, some cloud engineering 
what's happening is that they are comparing the behavior of this graph between his system with cows and with the cows. The, the, the red one is with cows, the black one is without cows. And notice that the um, form of the graph is more, the shape of the graph is exactly the same or more or less the same. So this means that the application is um, behaving correctly, right? They are introducing cows and the application from the point of view of business still behaves in the same way. If you see here some changes, then it means that you've introduced the cows and there are something that is not uh, behaving correctly, right? So for this reason, it's really important to define a correct a steady phase, right? a steady state. We need to know when the uh, service is working correctly. Then there is the hypothesis. It's when you ask what happened in case of one service that started turning error codes. Latency is increased to uh, 500 milliseconds. The database is not available. Time travel, these are really interesting uh, cars. Is what's happening if someone changes the time clock or the clock of your service? What's happening with your application? Have you ever tried? I think it's worth to try it and see what's happening, right? Because this could happen. Or what's happening if I partially uh, delete a Kafka topic? It's a recovery, not? Well, this is something that you need to see. Then you need to run the experiments, right? So you've, you've started an hypothesis saying, what's happened if my service, my service, whatever, my service uh, account service, a star behaving incorrectly and returning 500 errors. What's happened with the calls of this service? Okay, then you need to run this experiment. Of course, what is important about an experiment is to containerize the experiment. When I'm saying containerize, I'm not saying put it inside Docker, right? I'm saying to reduce the blast of the of the of the of the cows. So for example, you can just use a canary release and saying, I'm going to send the 90% of the traffic to a pod, because we are, for example, in Kubernetes, we just behaving correctly, and then I'm sending 10% of the traffic to a pod, then now it's behaving incorrectly. I mean, it's the same version maybe, but one is starting to send randomly 500 error code. Or you can use a dirt canary. So instead of doing it by 90% or 10%, you can say all the traffic goes to the version V1, but if the traffic comes from this range of IPs or, I don't know, a header within a specific flag, then the traffic is free route to this new version. What is it important to do when, um, when you run an experiment is define the expected behavior. And the, and the expected behavior is not that the system is going to work as expected, because obviously, depending on the cows, the system cannot continue running in the same way. The thing is that it should continue working, right? And I always uh, like to uh, show the, um, uh, this example of Netflix. If you have Netflix, you know that at the bottom or at the top of the, of the, of the, of the UI, you see that this something like, these movies are recommended for you or they are special for you, right? So they have some kind of service that they are doing some kind of um, artificial intelligence thing, trying to figure out what might like you. But what's happening if this service is down? Then in this case, what it's doing Netflix is just going to the top of the most built things. So instead of finding things that are the best for you, they just go to the most played movies and they say, hey, probably you like, or you might find interesting all these movies. So of course, the system is not exactly the same, right? Because in one, they are using the artificial intelligence service. So the uh, results are more accurate, but since the service is down, then they have a fallback, which is like, okay, I'm going to show you all the, all the movies that most of the people likes. And this is the expected behavior that you, are, uh, that you, are, you need to define to make this uh, experiment uh, successful. 
And of course, make it public within the organization. It's really important that everyone knows exactly when a cow's test is going to be run. Because it's important that the operations guys don't uh, become crazy because, you know, someday without any reason, they start seeing that some pods are dying randomly. And it's like, okay, what's happening with these pods? They are dying. Why? Right? It's like everything is behaving correctly, but I'm just seeing that some pods are terminating abruptly and I don't know why. Right? So it's important to make it public and communicate to the ops uh, team saying, be aware because between this, uh, this, you know, this time or this range of hours, you will see some pods that are dying randomly. So, you know, be aware. So I think that this is really important. The next thing is that, okay, I've run the, pro I've run the, the experiment and now it's time to compare the results between the current state and the steady state. So maybe um, it's, it's time to validate if the experiment has break something or not. Maybe it has not broken anything. Everything is in a steady state, as we've seen before in the case of Netflix. They see that the play um, frequency is exactly the same as before the, the, the cows. Then that's fine. If not, it's time to identify the problem. So I said, okay, it seems that we break something and it's not behaving as we expected. So we need to fix it. Okay, then you identify these problems. And what is more important is recover the system to the STD, uh, STD state, right? So we need to get back, draw back all the cows and make the system work as before we, as before the experiment. Then after the validate, it can happen that it's time to fix the problem, right? If it worked, if the experiment work as expected, it meets the expectations, then you are good. If not, the first thing is like not to blame anyone, right? Because then if you break, if you run an experiment and you've broken all the cluster, probably they will start finding who was the responsible of, you know, uh, or who has the brilliant idea of doing cows engineering? Oh, you, because of you, you know, uh, all these things has been broken. Or maybe we'll find the tester who wrote the test and said, hey, why you wrote this test? This test, you know, it was really um, a disaster. Or maybe we will find the developer and say, ah, oh, developer, how the hell you introduced this bug, right? Because of this bug that has been, you know, um, Seen because of this cow engineering test, now we have lost all these uh, tons of, of dollars, right? No, no blame. What you need to do is just check what's happening, why happened, and then escalate because maybe the problem is really, uh, it's a really important problem. So it's like, oh, we, need, we never figured out what's happening if the database is down. Now we, we've tried it and whoa. We've got a really serious problem, so maybe you need to escalate to prioritize the uh, and start developing a fix for that, or maybe it's a problem that it's unlikely that it happens, or it's not really important. And then you say, okay, we have identified that you know there is this problem, and let's put it in our backlog and let's fix it when we have time. So. Why is, why is Kubernetes important in all this cloud engineering and resiliency stuff? And it's important because Kubernetes has some kind of techniques that helps you uh, make your um, services or your application more resilient. And we're going to see it in the demo sooner. But of course, if you want even more powerful things, more resiliency things, then you should use Kubernetes plus Istio. I don't know if you know what is Istio. Istio is a service mesh, and a service mesh is a dedicated infrastructure layer for making service-to-service -service communication safe, fast, and reliable. So if you're wondering how it works, it was in this way. So we've got um, one pod with one container, okay, and then the service mesh, it just intercepts the traffic and manipulate the traffic. So instead of go, it's doing a direct 
connection between service A and service B, what you are doing is just doing a connection between service A, the service mesh, for example, in this case, an Istio proxy. This Istio proxy then does the request to service B. In fact, it's not service B, it's the, in case of Istio, the uh, service mesh proxy of service B, and then this service proxy just do the a request to service B and the same for service D. So basically you can think like um, a service mesh is like a interceptor of traffic. So we can manipulate this traffic for implementing some uh, functionalities that helps us to make our services more resilient. For example, um, <clears throat> what we can do with uh, Istio is do automatic retries. Suppose that you are sending a request and then there is an error. Probably if you do a, re a retry, then it will work as expected. So you can use Istio to make these retries make it of course automatically. So you, didn't, you do not need to code anything. You just do your request in your code and then Istio will take care of this for you. And if it detects an error, then a retry is going to happen. The same for Bauka hit pattern, circuit break pattern, pull ejection or request timeout. All these patterns that comes from resiliency, probably most of you already are already using some of them. If you're into the Java system, then probably you're using Istrix or resiliency for J to you know, make these things happen. Then all this, all this um, stuff, all these functionalities, uh, all these futures are good from this library into a Istio proxy. So you, you do not need to take care of anything. And the other thing that we can do with Istio is inject some uh, failures if you, if you wish, right? But let me introduce you another, uh, for example, if you want to use it with Istio, you want to introduce in, uh, uh, one fault injection, you can do it with this. You just create a Kubernetes, um, a Kubernetes resource, which is a type virtual service, you set which host you want to add the failure. So you said in the rating service, and I want to uh, abort. So it's like, okay, I want to add an, a 500 uh, return error for all the uh, requests that happens to rating. So any request that happens to, re to ratings, it will return a 500. But notice that here, what I'm saying is adding a new header, which is called end user, and I said exact Alex. So I'm containerizing the experiment. And I'm saying, I just want to return 500 error when someone sends a request to rating service, and this someone has a header with a key end user and a value Alex. So when Alex is doing a request to ratings, then a 500 um, error code is going to be get back, right? And then you can do just skip cattle apply minus F follower, and then this is going to happen. But of course, notice that you are missing something here, right? Because here you are just injecting the failure, but we are skipping all the phases of um, chaos engineering, like for example, defining a steady state, um, um, run the, the experiment, um, uh, define the hypothesis and so on. And for this reason, I really like Chaos Toolkit. Chaos Toolkit is a toolkit which basically not just works with um, Kubernetes, but also for Amazon or for Google Cloud or for you know for, uh, 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 several, several drivers. For this reason, I'm just uh, introducing you here Chaos Toolkit. We are going to see in the last slide more specific Chaos um, um, engineering tools for Kubernetes, but this one adapts to Kubernetes, but also to other um, platforms. So you basically do these kind of things, which you define a JSON file where you define the steady state. So you define when my application is working correctly. And I'm just saying, okay, my application is working correctly if all my pods are available and healthy. So if my greetings pod is available and healthy, then my application is behaving correctly. Then I need to define the experiment. What's happened if I stop um, a pod? 
if I kill a pot, right? Then it's, this is what I'm doing here. I'm just saying, I want to terminate the pots. You see here that I'm terminating the pot. And I want to, uh, and I want to terminate all the pods which are with a label called Spilo Roll Epoch Master, and the pattern of the pod is greeting DB, right? So I'm just killing the database pod. And then I can even do a pulse of two. And finally, I want to verify that the experiment, when I kill the DB, it's working as expected. I'm just saying that uh, the, the prop. The, the proof is that application must respond. This application must respond is a reference to the steady state, right? So I'm just saying that my application is a steady. And then of course you can, for example, in this case, lock all the information. And finally, you need to define a robot section saying, if the experiment is not working correctly, I need to remember to do a robot and apply some, um, Countermeasures, so my um, cluster uh, are get it back to a, a steady state and a state which you know we can con we can serve requests again as expected. And we just can just run with cows run experiment. And of course, you can, for example, use uh, in case of you're using Amazon and not Kubernetes, you can do things like uh, a stop NAC2. Uh, region, you say I want to uh, stop the U.S. West one region, and then you run this, and then this region will just be stopped, and then you can validate what's happening. Um, as I said, there are a lot of um, other uh, specific cows engineering uh, tools. This glue shot, powerful seal, cows toolkit, litmus, Pumba, cube invaders, and cows mesh. And if you are specific to Kubernetes, I recommend Chaos Mesh. I think that is the most completed, most focused to Kubernetes. Linux is also really well. And if you're not into Kubernetes or you are into Kubernetes and other things, like for example, Amazon or Google Cloud and so on, then I recommend you to go to Chaos Talking. And let's see it in a quick demo. I've got here my cluster. Let me do, for example, get, um, get notes. Okay, so you can see that in my case, I've got three master nodes and six worker nodes. Okay, and I've got here my application. You do Qcutter get pods. You can see my application, which basically is a consumer that calls the, to a provider. And basically, what's happening is that consumer calls provider and provider returns a message. In this case, it returns hello. I can do a call to, um, to the service and notice that it returns hello. It returns hello because the request is sent to the consumer. This consumer makes a request to the provider, the provider returns hello, and then the hello is sent back from the consumer to the call, right? So for that reason, you can do a call and I get it like, uh, um, a hello. Now, if you see my experiment, which is here, do a bad, a chaos uh, with bad, bum, 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 bum. experiment, pot termination, oops, pot termination, Okay, probably you cannot see anything. Let me do it with a cut. Okay, notice that what I'm, I'm doing here is just saying, my, uh, my service is in a steady state when the service returns a 200, okay? Then I want to terminate a pod, and this pod, the pod that I'm terminating is the one which is my provider APB, so I'm just killing this pod. And then what I want to check is that my application still responds. So I just do a, a request to the service and it still returns a 200. Then if you do, if you say, if you see that I do a kubectl get pods, you see that I only have one provider instance. So obviously if I kill this instance, then you will receive no, um, no request. So I can do cows run experiment pod termination. Okay. And notice what's going to happen is like critical steady state proof is not in the given tolerance. So it's failing, right? Notice that this pod, the provider, was started six hours ago. And now you do keep cut or get pod. You see that has been started 15 seconds ago. So it effectively killed this pod, then it ran up the, 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 the test to check if the service is behaving correctly or not. 
And obviously it says no, because there is no provider. So it returns a 500, which is different of 200. So I've detected, right, that my, my system is going to fail if the provider service is down, right? How could, how could I fix this? Okay, I could do, for example, keep cut all. Scale deployment, replica tool. So I'm just creating two replicas. And notice how easy it is to create replicas, more instances of my services with Kubernetes. Notice that I'm just doing kubectl, now get pods, and you'll see that I have two instances of my provider. This is my provider, and this another my provider, and one my consumer, right? And notice that I've not, I've not done anything special. I've just said kubectl scale. And this is the great things about Kubernetes. For this reason, I said that Kubernetes helps you on making your application more resilient because with just running one command, boom, uh, Kubernetes finds a worker node and deploy this service. And now let's do cows run experiment for termination, which remember that it kills one of my provider pod. Now I run it and now it works. There is no failure. Why? Okay. You can imagine that, notice how this uh, pod is terminating. And here is the new pod that Kubernetes has started for me, but since I was started starting this pod before running the test, now I killed the pod and I made the request, but since there was still one pod there, then everything worked as expected, right? So it returned a 200. Now let's do another experiment, just you know, to think about it. Let me, for example, do a chaos run experiment kill deployment so what's happened if i kill the deployment okay what's happened if instead of removing my pod i remove all the deployment this could happen because all the you know all the all the working uh, node was down or maybe because um someone did it um, by error and notice that of course i'm getting a critical right because it's saying okay you killed all the well, the provider, you have not killed the pod, you've killed everything. But if I do a kubectl get pods, you can see here that I've got a my provider instance of 13 seconds. And you will say, but how is this possible? If you killed the deployment, then there should be no provider, but there is one. And the reason is that if I do this experiment, kill deployment, I've defined here a rollback section saying, if there is a fail, then redeploy the provider deployment. And this is why uh, the deployment come to life after this critical error. So as you can see, you can play in an automatic way really easily with Chaos Toolkit and Kubernetes. So we are almost done. We've got two minutes before starting the, um, you know, the, uh, the questions. Uh, if you want to try all these examples with you, then you can follow this uh, link and you will, you know, you will check these experiments. So let's be down. Of course, uh, every adventure requires a first step. So don't start with, you know, doing chaos engineering and let's say, let's see what's happening if I kill all the clusters. Don't do that. Just start step by step with a small um, services and see how it goes. Again, start as small as close as possible to production. Maybe you will not be able to do it in production, but then try to find an environment that it's really close to how production looks like. Communicate with everybody. Have a failover plan because, you know, things can happen. And you need to find a really quick way of saying, okay, something went wrong. I push this and see what's happening. And I recommend you that do not automate everything, just start a, a manual. Of course, be realistic. The history helps you. Because some people ask me, how could I start? How I could, uh, you know, uh, do uh, uh, my hypothesis, and it's like the history helps you. Just ask to the operations people, the operations team, and ask them, hey guys, what are the problems that we found in the past? And they will give you a list, and then try to run these problems into your chaos engineering test. Uh, again, chaos engineering is not, it's, it's, you know, it's about experimentation, it's about explore to find new knowledge of how your system behaves. So it's really important to do it, to know exactly your microservices architecture, how it works when some failures happens. And yes, of course, maybe you will, you, you will you know, fail someday, especially the first time, 
but I think that it's worth to try and worth to use scale engineering to make your services more resilient. And that's all. Thank you very much. Uh, I will check in now the questions. And if not, you know, follow me on Twitter and you can ask me there. There is my YouTube channel. Email, you can send me an email, no problem. Thank you very much. And thank you so much. Now it's time oh, for the sorry. questions. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for the presentation. It was a really great overview of uh, chaos engineering. So um, one thing I, I actually, there, there is one question that I wanted to ask. It's you said that uh, there could be also all, sometimes some things that could go wrong. Uh, could you give some examples of what that could be while doing chaos engineering and uh, maybe some actually examples like from real life? Uh, yeah, well, uh, what I see that things can go wrong is like, um, I, I remember that some 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 time ago, I, I, I mean that maybe two years ago, I was talking with with one um, with one company. Said, "Hey, have you uh, uh, hear about cloud engineering?" And I said, "Yes, yes." And I said, "Are, are you using it?" And, yeah, we are using cloud engineering. I said, "Okay." And how it's how it how it you know how it goes? And, it, and they told me, "Oh, it goes horrible." And I said, "Yes, why?" And they told me, "Yes, because you know the first test that we tried was to kill our cluster." And see how much time we were able to, you know, to recover all the cluster, right? And it was like, okay, and what's happening? I said, yeah, that none of our clients could access to our system during two hours, right? So, yeah, so maybe first of all, we need to start with, you know, easy cows, easy hypotheses like what's happening if this service is down? What's happening if this service returns a 500. What's happening if I kill this pod? What's happening if the database is, uh, is, is down? What's happening if my um, in memory cache or uh, distributed cache is down? You know, try these things that probably is not going to, you know, you're not going to suffer a lot if something goes wrong and then move forward to more um, heavy things. I mean, that do not, do not start with it. This is the kind of thing that, that as I say, that things can go wrong. So at the very end, it's important to define your hypothesis, but it's also really important to have this red button to say, oh, something is really going really wrong. Push this button and all the cluster is again in the previous state, right? So it's this is uh, the things that as okay, I mentioned. So especially, yeah. it's really important to have a failover then, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've got, yeah, for what plan, failover plan, yeah, for, or thing. Maybe if you want to try to kill your, your cluster, that's fine. But then maybe it would be interesting to have a backup cluster. Mm -hmm. Kill the cluster, see what's happening. You said, oh, shit, everything is going really, uh, I mean, you know, with screw something, then redirect all your traffic to this backup cluster and then try to fix your principal cluster, things like that. Right? So yeah, it's important. OK, OK, that's, that's a really great insight. Thank you. Um, so and let's say, imagine that, I don't know, we're just uh, relatively medium-sized company and we want to start with chaos engineering, like where, what's the first small step would you make for that? Yeah, I, I would say that, for example, if you're in Kubernetes, then maybe move from service mesh uh, tool, which is really great. If you are more like Kubernetes and, you know, uh, and we, you're using Kubernetes, but also other, uh, other uh, deployment platforms, like for example, a Docker Swarm or just you know Amazon and so on. Then just just use Chaos Toolkit, which works pretty well. And then start to identify um, services that are stateless. For example, services that are stateless are really easy to recover, right? Because you just need to replicate it, and you have more 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 instances, and it just works. Then you could just start with the stateless services and say, okay, let's you know let's start to do some chaos. Um, on these services that, that are still is and see what's how how they behave, right? It's really easy to have a backup plan for, for these kind of services. Then when you feel comfortable with this, you can say, okay, let's start and let's move to services that has a database, but they have a lot of rates, but no rights, or almost no rights, right? And then let's see what's happening if we stop the database, right? What's happening if I remove the database and you know these kind of things. So you know always you know, be a step by step with uh, really um, simple services. And then, you know, you will st start getting confident and then you will start, um, um, you know, more and more or doing or adding more cows on your cluster, right? All right. Um, yeah, yeah, just as, yeah, just a final note. If you're curious, for example, uh, I know that Netflix is killing one region, right? Um, every two weeks. 
So every two weeks, at least one time, they are killing a region on purpose, right? So, okay, this is, you know, the, the top, and then, yeah, you need to, you know, find your yeah, way to write to this. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, thank you so much. That's for, for finishing perfectly on time. Uh, thank you for sharing the knowledge and hope you also enjoyed giving this talk. And sure. yeah, thank you. And you thank guys you for much. following us. See you in 10 minutes. <laughs>